Okay, well, let's get to it. Let's take a look at practice exam one. So here we are. This is Chem 102, practice exam one, fall 2020. And let's get started. So the first question says, which of the following best describes molecules related as conf conformational isomers? And the answer is like I just went over with you. It's molecules that have the same molecular formula, the same connections between the atoms, but different spatial arrangements of atoms due to rotation around bonds. So if you take a look at a molecule like ethane and you rotate that around the signal carbon-carbon bonds, you will get different conformational isomers. I'm just going to throw this out to my students. Let's take a look at question number two. It says, which... Um, which type of compound is not classified as an aliphatic hydrocarbon? Can anybody help me out with this one? You can type it in the chat or unmute your mic. I'm just typing there. Hi there to my students. Yeah, Jessica and Taylor, um, Madison, they all say it's aromatic. Absolutely. It's aromatic. Aromatic is aromatic, right? Aliphatic hydrocarbons. An aliphatic hydrocarbon can be an alkane, alkene, alkyne, or a cycloalkane. They all count as aliphatic, and then aliphatic, and then aromatic, of course, counts as aromatic. All right, so let's move on to the next question. It says here, benzene may be represented by the line formula shown below. What is the molecular formula of benzene? Does anybody have an idea about this one? Taylor says B, a few other people say B. I agree with you, right? The answer must be C6H6. And you should be able to take a line formula or a bond line formula like is shown here, and you should be able to draw the um, Lewis structure as well, where we show all the carbons. We have our double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, alternating like that. And then we also have one hydrogen, attached to each of the carbons. And so that is the structure of benzene. And you can clearly see in here that we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogen. So C6H6. All right, let's move on to number four. It says, which of the following is not, is not a characteristic associated with undecane and 11 carbon straight chain alkane? If we were to draw undecane, it tells us it's 11 carbons and it's a straight chain. So we would start like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, like that. This would be undecane. So let's take a look at the answers. It says, is it nonpolar, a flammable liquid? It has a density less than water, hydrogen bonding, and low solubility, low water solubility. Does anybody have an idea about one of these? would not be a property of undecane. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Yes, thank you. The answer is D. Yeah, it's hydrogen bonding. Because in order for a molecule to possess hydrogen bonding, you have to have either a bond between hydrogen and nitrogen, a bond between hydrogen and oxygen, or a bond between hydrogen and fluorine. And there is obviously no nitrogens, oxygens, or fluorines in this molecule. And so there is no hydrogen bonding capable in undecane. I just want to point out that undecane is a hydrocarbon, a hydrocarbon, which consists of only carbon hydrogen bonds and carbon carbon bonds. Those are both nonpolar bonds. And so this molecule is definitely nonpolar. Hydrocarbons like octane, butane, pentane, Propane, these are highly flammable substances. So this would be a flammable liquid. A density less than water, most hydrocarbons that aren't too large will float on top of water and they have a low water solubility. Why would that be? The reason why is because this molecule is nonpolar, right? And water, water is highly polar. It's a polar molecule. And you would remember the rule, like dissolves like. And so a nonpolar substance like undecane is not going to dissolve in a polar substance like water. Number five, the structure of an organic compound may be represented in several different ways. 
which formula for an organic compound explicitly shows all of the atoms and bonds in the molecule? Hmm. Let's take a look here. We've got a structural formula, a molecular formula, a patent, a patent, a pattern formula, condensed formula, and line formula. Let's see. Some of my students are writing answers here. I need to check. Yeah, it would be a structural formula, right? A structural formula is going to show all of the bonds. Let's, let's say you were dealing with a molecule like ethane, right? If you had a molecule like ethane, well, the structural formula is going to show you all the bonds explicitly between the carbons and the hydrogens and the oops, and the two carbons like that. Whereas a molecular formula, that would only tell you the number of each element. A pattern formula is nothing that we've ever looked at. A condensed formula can show you, a condensed formula would be like CH3, CH3, but unfortunately condensed formulas um, don't show us all of the bonds and that's what it's telling you. It wants to show all the atoms and bonds. And then finally, a line formula doesn't show um, all bonds, right? It doesn't show any carbon hydrogen bonds. So we can even put that here, no CH bonds shown. I would say generally speaking, but anyhow, let's move on to number six. It says, how does an alkyl group differ from its parent alkene? I'll see what my students have to say about that one. Excuse me. Yeah, absolutely. My student said it's C. I would agree with you. It says here, an alkyl group an alkyl group contains one less hydrogen than its parent alkane. Examples would be things like if you have ethane, right, CH3, CH3, that's ethane. And then if you remove one hydrogen, so CH3, CH2, like this, then it becomes an ethyl, like that. Another one would be if you have CH4, that is methane. Methane, if you remove a hydrogen, CH3, you get a methyl, okay, so on and so forth. Let's move on to number seven. What is the molecular formula of the simplest alkane capable of having constitutional isomers? This one's a little bit tricky, but I'll see if my students were able to figure this one out. Yeah, Jessica says E. I'll go over this one um, kind of quickly here. CH4 and so the middle three, these ones here have no constitutional isomers, okay? No constitutional isomers. So what I'm saying is with these three molecular formulas, there's only one way to rearrange the atoms. With A, there's more than two ways. Um, there's more than one way of arranging these atoms. So C5H12, I'll show you. C5H12, you could have one, two, three, four, five. You could have pentane. You could have this. You could have 2-methylbutane. Or you could have this, which is 2,2-dimethylpropane. So that's got three constitutional isomers, but this one here, C4H10, it has two constitutional isomers. So it can either be one, two, three, four butane like that, or it can be two methyl propane, which is called isobutane. And so it only has two constitutional isomers. And so it is the simplest alkene capable of having constitutional isomers. Again, the other three that are in that blue box, they have no constitutional isomers. All right, number eight. It says a cycloalkane molecule contains eight carbons. How many hydrogens are present in the molecule? Who could help me out with that? Not a trick question. Yeah, somebody says 16, I, 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 or B, which is 16. I tend to agree with that, and the reason why is because when we have a cycloalkane, the generic formula is CnH2n. And therefore, if we have C8, right, we have H2 two times eight, which is going to be equal to C8H16. And so the answer must be 16 like that. Let's try some nomenclature. In question number nine, it says, what is the proper name for the compound shown below? Who could help me out with this one? Yeah, Eric says E. E for Eric, right? I agree with you, Eric. Yeah, because if you number these two methyl groups, one, two, three, we have our parent ring, right? The longest chain in here is a cyclo, a cyclohexane, and then we have two methyl groups, so this must be 
one three dimethylcyclohexane, but what else? We see that these two methyl groups are on opposite sides of the ring. And therefore, since they're on opposite sides of the ring, they are trans to each other. And so the name of this compound would be trans 1,3 dimethyl cyclohexane. Give me a thumbs up if you got that one. Trans 1,3 dimethyl cyclohexane. Perfect. Thanks, Johnny. Good. All right, great. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, the reason why I just wanted to double check on that one is because I've had students before who would name it, you know, 1,3-dimethyl cyclohexane, but they would leave out cis or trans, you know, they would forget that sometimes. So I don't want you to forget that. Um, what else? Number 10, what term is used to describe the various spatial arrangements of a molecule formed by rotation around carbon to carbon single bonds? Well, this is kind of a repeat of the first question. These would be conformational isomers, right? Just different conformations, okay? Different conformations. There we go, let's move on to number 11. It says the large number of organic compounds is due in part of, to the ability of these compounds to form constitutional isomers. Which of the following pairs of compounds are related as constitutional isomers? Well, you can see that the first two are not constitutional isomers because the formula of the first one is C4H8 and the formula here is C4H10. So those are not constitutional isomers. If we look at the next one, we have, this is propane, right? This is propane here and this is propane here. So those are identical, identical compounds. If we take a look at the next two, you can see we have cyclopropane, which has a formula of C3H6. And then here we have propene, which has a formula of C3H1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That must be our answer. Anyhow, let's keep moving anyway. Take a look at the next one. The next one we have C1, 2, 3, 4. We have C4H9. Cl and C4H9Br. Those are not even isomers of each other. And the next one, these two are identical. These ones are identical. Identical. And so the answer is these two compounds, okay, are constitutional isomers. What does that mean? Their constitution is the same. They're made up of the same constitution. They're both made up of three carbons and six hydrogens, but they're not identical, right? They're different compounds. Again, this one is cyclo, cyclopropane, and this one here is called propene, like that. Okay, let's move on to number 12. The compound shown below can be made from the halogenation reaction of what compound? I'll throw this out to my students. Yeah, um, absolutely, yes. Thank you, Johnny, Jessica, Brianna, perfect. William, yeah, the answer is pentane, right? Because halogenation, halogenation is a substitution, substitution reaction, right? If we took a molecule of pentane, if we draw a whole molecule of pentane out, so, Normally I would use a bond line structure, but I just want to show you one last time a substitution reaction to make sure we're all on the same page. What's going to happen is we're going to treat pentane, right? This is pentane, and we're going to treat it with chlorine, and we're going to subject it to electromagnetic radiation in the form of light. And so we're going to substitute one of these hydrogens for a chlorine. So let's do that. We would end up with the product that's shown, we would end up with this product, and I'm just redrawing the actual product. Can anybody tell me what else we would get from this reaction? There is a second product that's not shown. Well, 
What would the second product be? Hydrogen halide. That's right. What would it be, Johnny? Do you know which hydrogen halide it would be? HCl. Yeah, absolutely. You'd also get HCl. So this is a substitution reaction. You substituted this hydrogen for a chlorine. Now remember, in Cl2, there are two chlorines. They're attached together like this. And so one of the chlorines went onto the molecule here, and the other chlorine, the other chlorine went to the HCl like that. Okay? All right, let me clean that up a little bit. There we go. Let's move on to number 13. What type of carbon-carbon bonds are never found in a saturated hydrocarbon? Yeah, both my most of my students said B, right? Double and triple bonds are never found in a saturated hydrocarbon. A saturated hydrocarbon would be all would be all single single bonds, okay? And would have a formula CnH2n plus two. All right, number fourteen. Oh, uh, we might have to fiddle around with this one because the answer is so long. Oh, no, it's just easy. Traces of chloroform were found in the trunk of a car of a Florida woman who was charged in the death of her child. Which of the following best represents the order of attachment of the atoms in chloroform? Well, they've given us they've given us this. Okay, they told us that we have CHCl3 like this. Well, carbon. Remember, I told you that carbon always always has four bonds now there's three there's sorry there's four other atoms there's a hydrogen and there's three chlorines so that tells you that the carbon must have four bonds one to hydrogen and three to chlorine like that so the most reasonable answer would be d there is the structure now notice that in my answer i have the um i have the hydrogen pointing up here and here they have it down there, but that doesn't matter. Those two structures are identical. All I would have to do is take this one and rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, and I end up with this molecule. You can clearly see that those are identical. So the answer is D. Number 15, what class of organic compounds contains the structure shown below? I think you guys already answered this one for me. which is aromatic. Did I circle the wrong one? A, B, so, oh, you're right. Thanks, William. There we go. I was testing you. Perfect. There we go. Okay, so the answer is, I didn't look close enough, did I? All right, aromatic compounds. Remember, benzene is aromatic. So we have benzene. Benzene is aromatic okay and you also need to know the names of other aromatic compounds right like toluene right you have to know phenol phenol you have to know what else aniline you have to know this one which is aniline what else you also have to know when you have a carboxylic acid called benzoic acid, benzoic acid. Another aromatic compound that we don't discuss a ton, but is good to know, is this one with a nitrogen in the ring. Can anybody tell me what this compound is called? This one that I just drew down here. Thanks, Johnny. Absolutely. It's pyridine. Yeah, pyridine. All right, there we go. Well, let's keep rocking and rolling here. This is butanone. The structure is shown. May be classified as what type of compound? A good functional group question. Who could tell me what functional group is found in this compound? Butanone. Yeah, Madison says a ketone. Absolutely, right? A ketone is when we have an R group and then we have a carbonyl sandwich in between the two R groups. And so clearly you can see here that we have a ketone. Remember, an ester, an ester is when we have a carbonyl 
and then another oxygen like this. And aldehyde is when we have an R group, a carbonyl, and there's a hydrogen attached. And ether is when we have an oxygen in between two R groups like this. And then a carboxylic acid. I mentioned that earlier, but I'll redraw a carboxylic acid is when we have a carbonyl with an oxygen and a hydrogen attached like that. And so you should be fully cognizant of all of these different functional groups. Let's move on to 17, which of the following is the condensed formula of 3-methylheptane. You know what I like to do with these kind of questions? I always like to start by drawing a bond line structure. So if I draw 3-methylheptane, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 carbons in my heptane. If I number them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Well, on my third carbon, I'm going to have um, oops, I'm going to have a methyl group like that. So there's three methyl heptane. Based off of that, could anybody help me out on which one of these looks the most reasonable? Yeah, I would go with C, right? If you look at C, okay. You can see that we have, let's follow it closely. You can see we have a CH3, oops. We have a methyl, right? So we got rid of that. Then we have a CH2, got rid of that. Then we have a methine, got rid of that. And it's got a CH3 attached to it. Then we have one, two, three methylenes. One, two, three methylenes like this. And then the methyl group on the end. And so that would be, the correct structure. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. The condensed structure. Cha -cha 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 -cha. Good. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Eric. All right. Well, let's see what's next. What is the IUPAC name of the following compound? First, we'll start by finding the longest carbon chain. There's a number of ways we could do that, but um, we want to find the longest carbon chain that has the most substituents. Let's see here. So one, two, three. So our longest carbon chain has propane in it. So this must be some kind of propane. And so we can cancel this one out. Um, we can cancel this one out. There we go. So we've eliminated A and we've eliminated C. Now what else? What substituents do we have on here? We have a bromine in the two position. So that would be a two. Bromo, and we also have a methyl group on carbon two, so that would be a two methyl. Now we have to order these in terms of alphabetical order, and B comes before M in the alphabet, and so this must be two bromo, two methyl propane. That better be one of the answers. Two bromo, two methyl propane. Boom. Cha. There we go. Correct answer. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you got that one right. Good. Great work, Jessica. And gang. <laughs> great. Excellent. That's great. Good, Ryan. Excellent. Let's move on. Hey, I'll just throw this out to my students. What's the IUPAC name of this compound? Number 19. Yeah, Eric, perfect. Brianna, good. Just plain old methyl cyclohexane. Remember, I mean, this one is, they kind of laid the answer out for you that there's no locants, right? There's no numbers in any of these answers. Okay? So remember that when you only have one substituent on a ring, you don't have to give it a locant because it would be redundant. So this is methyl cyclohexane. I want to point out that sometimes I've seen students circle toluene. Toluene is an aromatic compound, right? Toluene has double bonds in it like this. That's toluene, okay? I, it frustrates me when I see students mix up cyclohexane and benzene, which are two very different compounds, right? Cyclo, cyclohexane, and benzene. All right, because cyclohexane has twice as many hydrogens in it. Anyhow, just something to think about moving forward. Number 20, 
Which structural formula is represented by the condensed formula shown here? Let's just take this condensed formula and dissect it. If we start with the first carbon, let's number them. One, two, three, like that. And then we have four and five here, okay? Well, carbon always has to have four bonds. So the carbon that's number one, so we have carbon number one. Let's just go one, two, three, like this, okay? So we can put four like that. Well, carbon number one, it says it's got two hydrogens, but it also has a bromine attached to it. That would give me my four bonds to carbon. The next carbon is a CH2, but it's already attached to this carbon and this carbon. So it does have four bonds. The next carbon is only attached to one hydrogen. Let's pencil that one in. What else is it attached to? It's attached to two methyl groups. So I'm going to have one methyl group out here like this, and I'm going to have another methyl group, and I'm just choosing to draw it pointing down this way. It doesn't matter how it's drawn. So you can see that this would be the representation of this condensed formula, it would be C. All right, let's keep moving. Number 21, what's the IUPAC name of this one? I'll just throw that out to my students. Does anybody get the did anybody get the IUPAC name of this one? Yeah, good. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Johnny. Perfect. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah. We find the longest carbon chain. And then you see that we have two methyl groups. Now, it's important that you understand it wouldn't matter where you chose that longest carbon chain. You could have chosen it here. That would work. You could have chosen it like this. That would work. You could have chosen it like this. No matter what, you're always going to end up with the same answer. Look, if I number my carbons one, two, three, on carbon two, I have two methyl groups. So I have two, two dimethyl propane like that. All right. Two, two dimethyl propane. The common name for this compound, common, the common name is iso no it's um isopentane so it escapes my memory at the moment all right i'll come back uh let's see here how many secondary tertiary secondary and tertiary carbons respectively are in the following compound so remember if you have a carbon that is attached to only one carbon. So if you have a carbon that's attached to one carbon and it's all others are hydrogens, that would be a primary carbon. If you have a carbon that is attached to one, two carbons, oops, not a chlorine, one, two carbons, and the rest are hydrogens like this, that would be a secondary carbon. If you have a carbon that is attached to one, a chlorine on the brain, one, two, Oh, again, one, two, three carbons like this. That would be tertiary like this. And of course, if you have a carbon that's attached to one, two, three, four carbons like that, we call that quaternary. Now, if we go around this molecule and we look here, you can see that this carbon is attached to only one carbon. So that would be primary. In fact, any methyl group, so we have all of these methyl groups, one, two, three, four, five. Those are all, those are all primary carbons. Okay. Now let's move on and take a look at, um, let's take a look at secondary carbons. You can see that here we have a CH2 and here we have a CH2. And so these are secondary carbons. If you look at the tertiary carbons, ones that are attached, you have a tertiary carbon here, another one here, and another one here. And so those are our tertiary carbons. And so if we add up the numbers of them for primary carbons, we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have five of those. For secondary carbons, we have one, two. And for tertiary carbons, we have one, two, three. And so the answer must be two and three. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Throw it up there. 
Neopentane. Perfect. Thanks, Johnny. All right. Here we go. Which of the following best describes the changes that occurred in the reaction shown below? Who's got an idea about this one? Brianna and Taylor and Eric all say A. So does Jessica. I agree. This is a hydration reaction, right? This is nothing more than a hydration reaction. What happens in a hydration reaction? Adding H2O to a molecule. Okay. So on one of the carbons, we put on the OH, and on the other carbon, we put on the hydrogen. Now we left it out because it's a bond line structure, but it's still there. We still make that, we still make that assumption. All right, so this is a hydration reaction. It says a hydrogen atom and a hydroxyl group have been added to the reactant. Nothing more than that. Uh, the next one, I hope you can tell that this is an alkyne. It's the only possibility because there's not enough hydrogens for it to be an al alkene. So this is a triple bond. Triple, triple bond. Who can tell me the name of this molecule, number 24? Yeah, my students are all saying D. It's two half done, right? If we number the carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you can see that the triple bond is on carbon two. It starts on carbon two, and we have seven carbon. So if we had a seven carbon alkane, it would be heptane, right? That would be an alkane. And if we have a seven carbon alkyne, alkyne the suffix changes to heptine. And we have to give the triple bond a locus, and so this is two F nine like that. All right, just keep in mind that if we had numbered in the opposite direction, if we had started over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then you'd have five F nine, which is not the correct name. That's there's nothing, there's there's no molecule called five F nine. It doesn't follow the IMU pack rule. We always want to give that triple bond, the lowest possible number for the locus. All right, let me erase those green numbers and let us never speak of them again. Okay, let's move on to 25. It says here, which compound shown below is not an isomer of the molecular formula C5H8? Well, let's take a close look at C5H8 and see if we can come up with a generic formula for that, All right? C5H8 is CNH2N minus two. And when we, where have you seen that before? You've seen that with an alkyne. Right? Alkynes have the general formula 2N plus two, or 2N minus two, sorry. And that means that in this molecule, we must have two units, two units of unsaturation, unsaturation. Now, if you're wondering, what's a unit of unsaturation? Units of unsaturation. What's the unit of unsaturation? It could be a double bond, okay, a double bond, or it could be a ring. So a double bond is one unit of unsaturation, so one unit. A ring counts as one, and a triple bond, a triple bond counts as two units of unsaturation. So if I look at the first molecule, it has one double bond, so it only has one unit of unsaturation, so that is not an isomer of C5H8. In fact, you could double check that. This is C5H10. In this molecule, we have a ring and we have a double bond, and so this one would be C5H8. And the next one, we have two double bonds, and so this would be C5H8. In the next one, we have a ring and a double bond, and so this would be C5H8. And then in the last one, we have a triple bond. And so that would be C5H8. And so the correct answer is A. It's the only one that has only one unit of unsaturation and therefore does not have the correct molecular formula. Okay, number 26. In the food industry, what substance undergoes hydrogenation to produce margarine? Anybody have an idea about this one? You know that down here in America, we don't need a ton of margarine. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Madison. 
It's vegetable oils, right? What they do is they take, you know, vegetable oils, which are basically long chain, unsaturated fatty acids, for lack of a better, you know, drawing, okay? Like this, and then they subject them to hydrogenation in the presence of a catalyst, and then they partially hydrogenate them until they get the desired consistency of margarine. Anyhow, so we take an unsaturated, un, nope, unsaturated fatty acid from, from vegetable oils. Right. And remember, I told you that um, when you take an unsaturated fatty acid, acid and you subject it to the hydrogenation condition, sometimes these cis double bonds can undergo isomerization to give you a trans double bond, and that's what we call a trans fat. Anyhow, let's move on to question number 27. Someone's got a big preamble here, but let's bust through it. It says bromine is often used as a quick test for the presence of unsaturation in an aliphatic hydrocarbon, bromine in carbon tetrachloride is red. When bromine reacts with an alkene or an alkyne, the alkyl halide form is colorless. Hence, the disappearance of the red color is a positive test for unsaturation. A student tested the contents of two vials, A and B, both containing compounds with the molecular formula uh, C6H12. Vial A decolorized bromine, but vial B did not. How may, hey, how may the results for vial B be interpreted? So let's take a close look at this one. So what it's telling you is that when you have a mixture of bromine, which is molecular bromine in carbon tetrachloride, CCL4, it is red, okay? So it is nice and red in color. It also tells you that um, when bromine reacts with an alkene or an alkyne, you end up forming a colorless compound. So it tells you that if you start with an alkene, okay, alkene or alkyne, you treat it with bromine. Let me use red, okay? You treat it with bromine in carbon tetrachloride, CCL4, and you end up with something that is colorless, okay? You end up with a colorless alkyl halide, okay? Now, it tells you that you're taking this compound here, C6, or two compounds that both have this molecular formula, okay, C6H12, okay? So we'll say vial A and vial, vial B. You take both of them and you treat them with bromine, in carbon tetrachloride, okay? I'm going to space here and I paste, okay? You take both of them and you treat them with bromine and carbon tetrachloride. In vial A, you end up with something that is colorless, okay? But in vial B, it's still red, okay? The color didn't go away. What's the conclusion that we could draw here? What's the conclusion about, about vial B? What must the unsaturation come from? Right, Eric says E, the vial must contain a cyclic compound, right? Because in this formula here, in this formula right here, we have what? We have one, unit of unsaturation. How do I know that? Because the generic formula is CnH2n. So what are my two possibilities? It can either be a, a ring or an alkene. They told us that an alkene will react, okay? But there's nothing that says that a ring will react. So vial B, the compound in vial B, it must, must be a ring because it will not react with bromine. All right, there we go. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me after that, that explanation. Sha, good, great. Okay, almost done. Um, which of the following correctly states Markovnikov's rule? 
as it applies to the addition of the generic reagent HX to an alkene. Anybody have an idea about that one? Yeah, my students are saying A, which is totally true. This is the, it says the hydrogen of the HX is going to add to the carbon of the double bond that has more hydrogens attached to it, right? That's the rule. The rich get richer. Let's look at an example. Let's say I had this. Let's say I had, you know, one butene. And I treat it with HCl, for example, right? X could be bromine or chlorine, right? Well, if I look at the carbons in the double bond, this carbon has one hydrogen and this carbon has two, right? I can differentiate those with colors. I have the red one, or sorry, the yellow one and the green one. So this is going to be the richer, the richer carbon because it's got two hydrogens attached. Right, this is going to be the poorer, poorer carbon because it's only got one hydrogen attached. And so when I add HCl across that double bond, this carbon is going to end up with the extra hydrogen, and the other carbon is going to end up with the chlorine. And that's my carbon account rule. Now, normally I wouldn't draw a product like that, I would draw it like this one, two, Three, four, and I would just put the chlorine like this to give me two chloro butane. But if you need to draw it out like this to help yourself out and to help yourself understand what the heck is going on, there's absolutely no problem with that. Okay, Mark Kovnikov's rule the rich get richer. Number 29, which of the following is the correct condensed formula for two butyne? Well, let's start by drawing. I always start by drawing a bond line structure. So if I have two butyne, I'm going to have one, two, three, four. This would be the bond line structure of 2-butyne. So if I wrote that out in condensed, it would be CH3C. Remember, we never leave out a triple bond in a condensed structure. You have to include that CH3 like that. And so the correct answer would be C like that. 2-butyne. Remember our carbons? 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 2 butyne. Um, what's the IUPAC name of the following compound? I'll throw that out there to my students to see if anybody got this one. What's the IUPAC name of the compound in question number 30? Yeah, it's 2-methyl-2-butene. Let's see if we can figure out the rationale here. We're going to find the longest carbon chain. So we'll go like this. One, two, three, four. If you're like Mr. Dion, that's not the chain I picked. If you went like this, one, two, three, four, either one of those are going to work. There is no cis and trans in this compound because on one of the carbons, we have two groups that are identical. And so there cannot be any cis or any trans. And so if I look at the longest carbon chain, I number it so that I give the substituent the lowest possible number. I have a methyl group on carbon number two. And so this would be two methyl. Right, two methyl, and then I have a double bond on carbon two, two butene. Okay, so two methyl, two butene, which is D. Boom, correct answer. All right. Number 31. What is the structure of the product of the following reaction? This one here is going to be an addition of water, right? If we take an acid catalyst, in water and an alkene, so alkene, okay, plus an acid catalyst. This is just going to be a hydration reaction, hydration reaction, or abbreviate reaction like that. Or another way you could put it is addition, addition of water to the molecule. Now, let me ask you a question. This is a yes or no question. Does Markovnikov's rule apply to this question? Do we have to be concerned with Markovnikov's rule? Okay, when somebody says yes, I say no. And I'll tell you why. We don't have to stress about Markovnikov's rule at all. Is because if we draw out this alkene, look at it. We have this alkene. This is ethylene. 
both carbons have the same number of hydrogens. It's the only time you have to worry about Markovnikov's rule is when you have an unsymmetrical alkene. And this is perfectly symmetrical. We have two hydrogens here and two hydrogens here. And so we don't have to stress about Markovnikov's rule whatsoever. And so when we add our H2O across the molecule, the hydrogen is going to go on one of the carbons and the hydroxyl is going to go on the other. Either way, you're going to end up with the same molecule, which is ethanol, which is right here, ethanol. So this is equal to CH3, CH2, OH. Does that help? Does that clear it up a little bit? Okay. All righty, well, let's move on to 32. What is the structure, the name of the major product of the following reaction? This is another example that uses Markovnikov's rule. Let's draw this compound out up here. We have CH3, CH double bond, CH2, like that. Okay. Look, I didn't even draw the bond line structure, okay? If you look at this carbon, this one is richer in hydrogens. It's got two. This is richer in hydrogens. This carbon is still part of the double bond, but it only has one hydrogen. And so it is the poorer of the two carbons, poorer. And so if I add HCl across that molecule, where is the hydrogen going to go? Is it going to go to the carbon on the right or the carbon on the left, the carbon in the middle? So right or middle? Yes, it's going to go to the carbon on the right. And so when I write this out, I'm going to have CH3. Still going to have CH here, but now I have the chlorine attached, and I still have my CH3 here. And so that molecule, if I name that molecule, I'll start by finding, finding the longest carbon chain, one, two, three, like this. I have a chlorine at carbon two, and so that is two chloropropane, right here, two chloropropane. Number... Um, oh, yeah, you're right, Johnny. There's a mistake here, isn't there? In the condensed formula, this should say CH3 like that. Okay, there we go. Let's move on to number 33. It says, which of the following terms best describes the geometry around the carbon atom with the bonding pattern shown? Does anybody know what the molecular geometry of this carbon is? Yeah, the geometry is trigonal, trigonal planar. Okay, so these students have it, right? When carbon has four single bonds, right? When carbon has four single bonds like this, that is tetra, tetrahedral. And when carbon has one single bond, and a triple bond like that, then it is linear, okay, linear like that. Okay, number 34, acetylene or ethylene gas is a gas at room temperature. We can start by drawing the structure of acetylene or ethylene. It's an alkyne. It's going to be this. Okay, simplest alkyne known to man is a gas at room temperature because its boiling point is minus 84. What type of intermolecular forces hold molecules of acetylene together? So if I have another molecule of acetylene here, what intermolecular forces do these two molecules experience with each other? Yeah, just London forces, right? Because we only have carbon and carbon and carbon hydrogen bonds. And so London forces only. Remember, hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons only experience London forces, a hydrocarbon, like that. Okay, number 35. How many moles of hydrogen gas 
are needed to convert one mole of ethyne to ethane. Well, let's take a look here. If I draw the molecule ethyne, which is acetylene, so we have our triple bond like this. If I start it with one mole of this, and I want to make this, okay, I want to have one, two, three, four, more hydrogens attached, right? This is ethyne, and this is ethane. Did anybody tell me how many moles of H2 did I need to do this? Not a trick question. Yeah, the answer is two, right? Because every H2 molecule has two atoms of hydrogen in it, and I need to add one, two, three, four. So what times two gives me four? And the answer is two. So the answer is I would need two moles. So the answer is one mole of my alkyne and two moles of my hydrogen. And there you have it. That covers the entire practice exam. It took us what? It took us about an hour to get through the whole thing as a group. And you will be given more time than that. You're given 120 minutes on response. I highly recommend using the computers on campus. And that is why I gave you an extension through to Tuesday. Please see my announcement regarding that. So that gives everybody extra time. Even if you have the lab tonight, you still have Tuesday to look at the um, exam. Again, if there's any questions about your Wi-Fi or your technical abilities with Respondus, just head over to the campus and see my previous announcement that tells you which computers have Respondus um, installed. And I highly recommend using one of those.